Hello, and welcome to the CSSP exam prep part one. My name is Mark Edmead, and I'll be your instructor. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the question and comment box. So now we're going to talk about access controls. We're moving to another one of the domains called access control systems and methodology. So in this module, we're going to talk about access criteria. Remember, we talked about the fact that we need to make sure that people have the right access to the different resources and to the different assets. So we're going to talk about how to determine the criteria by which people are going to gain access. We're going to talk about defining rights and permissions. Again, who can do what to the assets. And then we're going to talk about several access control models. So what you're expected to know in this domain is the basic access control concepts and methodologies. We're going to talk about the different preventative, detective, and corrective techniques used to minimize and avoid risk, exposures, and vulnerabilities. And we're going to talk about the different mechanisms you can use to assure a system's availability, confidentiality, and integrity. So the question always comes up is, is why do we need access con controls? Well, one of the main reasons is that we just don't want people to have access to all of the systems, to all of the networks, to all of the data files. We need to really control that access to information. So the main concept, again, is to remember that the three things that we need, we need to protect is, is the confidentiality, integrity, and the availability of the data. And so we need to have those controls to make sure that either the right people are accessing the data or if the incorrect people, unauthorized people, are accessing that data, that we can detect that and make sure that, that, that we know that so we can take some actions. So let's talk about access criteria. What determines the criteria of a person actually having access? Well, one of the ways we can do it is by the individual or by the identity. Somebody who's an administrator, somebody by their name, maybe that's how they're going to get uh, by doing their access. Maybe it's by the role. Maybe they're a member of the administrators group. Maybe they're a member of the engineering type of group. So depending on the roles, they're going to gain certain access. Maybe it's by the location. Maybe a particular office, a particular building, a, a particular geographic location. That's also going to perhaps determine the access criteria. Maybe it's the time of the day or the day of the week. Sometimes we have people that work the second shift and the third uh, uh, shift. So perhaps we want to have them only have access between 8 o'clock at night and three in, the, 3 in the morning. So we can set up access that way. Maybe it depends on the transactions that they're going to be doing on the system. Maybe we have some service constraints that we have to worry about. And then we also have common access modes. These are things like read, write, execute. So that's how we determine the access criteria. So we need to think about the data that we're working with, the people that are going to, going to be accessing it, and the criteria by which they're going to be gaining access. So again, we talked about the location, we talked about the time, and we talked about the transaction. So again, these are just three ways that you can limit it. A lot of individuals uh, may only have access to a certain location. So if they work in the San Diego office and they go to the New York access, then maybe they don't have access to certain things because based on that location, they're only available, to, they can only view or see or touch the data that's in San Diego. So these are, again, things that you need to look for the consideration. In the service constraints area, we're looking at things like uh, depending on the application, Maybe certain applications have a requirement for only having three authorized users, so only three users can be logged on at the same time. That can be another criteria. And then, of course, we talked about the access control modes. The other thing that we need to think about is permissions versus rights. The permissions provide the users, or sometimes groups of users, authorization to do things like open, write, read, or to delete files. Rights define what a person or a user can do on the system. For instance, the right to log on to a workstation, the right to manage printer, the right to create accounts, the right to perform backups or other tasks. So we have to make that distinction between the permissions and rights. So when you're defining the permissions and rights, we have to consider the data owners, right? So this is the people that are that are going to own the actual information, and then we need to establish the rights and the permissions of the users and the groups. 
So for instance, I as the owner of the data, I can restrict the data and I could say this particular group is going to have full control, this particular group doesn't have access, and this group can only, can only read it. So we have the ability to access the data based on the rights and the permissions that have been provided by the data owners. One of the interesting concepts is something called the principle of least privilege. And this just means that in a secure environment, it's sometimes best to make sure that only you grant the necessary approvals and the necessary capabilities and permissions and rights for rights based for them to do their job. For instance, if you have somebody who's going to just work as a backup operator, that means somebody who's going to back up the system. Well, you could make them a member of the administrators group because the administrator group can also do the backups. But making them an administrator is way too much power. So we need to say, what is the minimum of rights and the minimum permissions that that particular user needs to have in order for them to perform their task? That is called the principle of least privilege. And then we also have to consider this thing called segregation of duties, also sometimes called separation of duties. And this just means that we need to divide the roles in certain ways that one person cannot sub subvert another type of a critical type of process. So which means that the person that's doing one thing can't necessarily do something else. So for instance, somebody that creates an account, let's say for a vendor, can't be the same person who also sets the credit limit on that account. Because then it's possible that a person can create a vendor, uh, increase the credit line, and they don't really have the authorization to do that. So we need to make sure that we separate the duties as much as possible. We also have to remember the concept of the CIA. And this is a theme that we're going to talk about reoccurring throughout the whole course, making sure that we address confidentiality, making sure that information is not disclosed to unauthorized individuals or processes, for that matter. We talk about integrity. This is where information retains its original accuracy, that things have not changed. And then, of course, we talked about availability, that making sure that the data is available in a timely manner. So let's talk about access control basics. Like everything else we talked about, everything begins with the security policy. This is the document that defines the acceptable actions as it relates to the access and dissemination of information. So again, without that, you don't know if people can see certain data or not see other data. So we really need to start with the security policy. We need to consider things like threats and vulnerabilities and risks that we, were, that we already covered. We already talked about what a threat is and an event that can pause, cause possible harm. A vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited. And the risk is the probability that that threat can actually happen. So there are several models that we can talk about when we talk about access control models. One of them is called discretionary. This is the one where the person decides, as the owner, who can access or, or not. Again, keeping in, in mind that there's a rule called the need to know. Just because somebody has access doesn't mean that they should have access because there's that need to know basis. So that's the discretionary. I have the discretion of allowing access to certain resources. And then we have the mandatory. The mandatory is where control is based on the clearance. This is used a lot in the government agencies where there's another third party uh, system, a third party policy that really controls the access based on the fact that the person either has a top secret type of clearance or, or a secret uh, one. Then we have non-discretionary access con controls. Right? Again, just a little bit like the mandatory, this is where a central authority de uh, will define what subjects have access to what objects. Discretionary access control. Sometimes you'll see that we refer to as to the DAC. This is where a subject can specify what objects can be accessible. This is done primarily through the use of access control list. So for instance, in Windows, if you right click on a file, you can go to the properties. And in the properties, you can look at the access control list. And from there, you can say, again, as the owner of the object or the administrator, you can say, these people will have full access, these people have read-only, these people have no access whatsoever. Also, on the firewalls, when you look at a, at a firewall, well, the firewall rules say it's an access control list of who can do what. Now, the user can alter the access to certain objects. 
and that is called user directed discretionary access control. So there's different forms of the DAC. One of them is the identity based. This is where the access is granted based on the user uh, identity and or the resource identity. It could be user directed, right? This is that we talked about where the user can say and grant access. And then we have the hybrid, which is a combination of the two. So it doesn't matter what type of access control, either discretionary or mandatory, there is, should be some form of accountability. So this is where you need to make sure that you have a system or that systems are in place that is able to record and log access to certain files because we want to make sure that people have the access, but also we need to monitor them and make them accountable for any changes to, to that access. And this is where we, where we call auditing. Right, where we can go ahead and we can audit that information. Mandatory access control. This is where objects have a label, and that label has a classification. And based on the person's security level, they can gain access to it. So again, remember those classified um, areas that we talked about for the government. We said unclassified, confidential, secret, and top secret. So depending on their classification level, then they get to see certain data. So somebody who perhaps doesn't have a secret uh, capabilities, in other words, that their clearance isn't high enough, they won't be able to see something that is top secret because their clearance level doesn't match the classification of the actual object. We also have to remember that need to know basis because just because they are cleared to get that information doesn't mean that they, has, that they have to have access. So that's another area that you need to be concerned about. Under mandatory access control, we have rule-based and we have administratively directed. So when you're talking about rule-based, we're talking about access that is granted on a resource based on the resource rules. And then the administratively you know, granted are the ones that are granted by an administrator. Then we have this non-discretionary access controls. This is where a central authority will determine what subjects have access to what objects. It could be based on the role or it could be based on, on the task. So, for instance, the role could be somebody who's an, an administrator. Then based on that role, then they would get certain, certain access. And then another type of access control non-discretionary is called the lattice access control. This provides an upper and lower band for the permissions. So if you notice here on this slide, it talks about the four levels of data class uh, data classification. And so the user can then be granted based on the lower and upper boundaries. They can see everything from confidential to top secret, or they can see everything from public to the secret, depending on, on how you want to do it. So uh, do you have any questions? If you have any questions, make sure you use the comment box. Thank you for joining us. This concludes our talk about access controls and access control systems methodology.